and unpause screen sharing. All right, good morning. I'm Hilary Stupa. I'm a software developer with Qdabra Software. And today we are going to talk a little bit more about Microsoft Flow, which I know uh, Jen Lindsay did an excellent introduction to um, last week. I got a chance to watch that and really enjoyed her webinar. And I hope uh, some of you were able to attend that as well. Um, and just real quick, I know Patrick talked about this last week, and some of you are aware of Forms Viewer. It's a new product we have. Um, it's great for your browser forms. It's especially great for your browser forms in Office 365. Publishing the breeze. Um, some of our more popular Q rules commands are uh, incorporated in there. Um, so definitely if you haven't checked it out, and especially if you're using Office 365 browser forms, you should check it out. We do also have it available for on-premises, um, but yeah, I just wanted to, just wanted to mention that. Um, so before we get started, I do have a couple of polls, and I'm just going to run those real quick, and hopefully um, I will remember <laughs> to turn it off after you guys have answered. Um, so I'm going to give you just a minute. I just want to know if you guys have, have tried Flow, if you've used it at all. Um, you know, it's one of those uh, products that's kind of new, and like a lot of these new things that come out in Office 365, I think for a lot of us, you know, we have this new stuff that just sort of shows up, and then we go poke at it, and we're like, oh, I don't know if this is useful to me or not. We maybe forget it. We maybe don't. Um, so we got a pretty good percentage of folks who voted here. Um, quite a large percent, you know, 68% haven't tried it yet. Um, 21 have a little bit, and, and some people are using it. Um, you know, for some simple things, which I think uh, Flow is excellent for some of these these simple things. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and just uh, close this poll, and I've got one more I'm going to launch, and then we'll we'll move into the heart of things here. Um, so I'm closing this guy, and now I'm going to start this new one, and I'll tell you why I'm asking this in a minute. And this is about. Um, getting a sense of, of what your risk tolerance is. We all work in different industries. Um, you probably know that the company I work for uh, does a lot of consulting. So I have the opportunity to work with people in a variety of industries. And, and I know that those of you who are, uh, for example, in healthcare, um, it's pretty likely your stuff is of a higher criticality than maybe somebody who's um, selling shoes, right, in retail. And, and that doesn't mean that both of these businesses don't have valid and important needs. It just means in one business, people actually die if things go wrong. And that's kind of how I always rate criticality. I, some of you have, have maybe heard me talk about this before, but I worked in, um, when I was younger, I, wor I worked in healthcare for a while, and I worked in an Alzheimer's and dementia care center. And I mean, that stuff's mission critical. The work people do uh, in healthcare is is definitely oh wow something goes wrong somebody can be hurt or die, um, and then I've also you know <laughs> I've tended bar and waited tables and and stuff like that. And barring food food related illnesses, you know somebody doesn't die if I'm a bad waitress. So at any rate, uh, it's just kind of I, I wanted to get a sense of that, and I'm going to close this poll and let me make sure I am screen sharing again. So it looks like I'm screen sharing again. I'm going to flip to the next slide. Now the reason I'm asking about that in terms of these new products that come out in Office is I have found in Office 365 because of the fact that we are sort of often working with Microsoft's bleeding edge stuff. You know, this is the new stuff. They're updating it regularly. And you and I both know they've got test teams working on, on, on stuff, and we know they're testing and reviewing things. But I have seen things that are working stop working rather suddenly, and then they start working again when something gets fixed or someone reports the the issue to Microsoft. So that's just something to be aware of uh, with Flow. There's, there's one thing I'll show you today that um, has worked differently in the past than it is working right now, and I anticipate it will change again in the future. And so you need to 
um, have that in mind when you're choosing some of these tools for the things you're doing. And, and this is not to discourage you from using these tools. It's just simply something that you need to be, you need to be aware of. Um, another little thing I want to mention now is that uh, as I'm going through this stuff, I kind of want to demo as I go. I have one sort of full demo set up for the end of the webinar. But otherwise, I'm touching lightly on a wide variety of topics because there's a lot to look at here. And, and I want you to come away from this with a sense of what's out there so that when you think of a new process you need to work on or when you think of a process that needs some assistance or some automation, you'll, you'll have something in the back of your head go, oh yeah, I think that Flo might be able to do that. I'm going to go look at that. Um, Obviously, we all know these little webinars, these little short, you know, 40-minute things. We can't dive too deep into specific details, and every single use case that every single one of us has is unique in its own special way, right? We, we aren't all building the same stuff. But I, I really wanted to um, show you a lot of different things so that you can get a sense of what all's out there. So we are going to look at a couple of, of uh, different features and, and some little troubleshooting things um, that I hope won't hang you up. They have hung me up, so I, I want to point them out to you. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about using Flow with SQL. Um, specifically, my demos, I've used SQL Azure, but we'll take a, a little look at the alternatives there. Um, getting user information from people picker data in a SharePoint list. Uh, OData filters, we are all hopefully a little familiar with OData. Um, creating, I, you know, I should have put quote marks around variables there. You'll see why in a few when we get there. And Jen Lindsay talked about advanced condition syntax. I want to look at that just a, a little bit more because um, I want to talk about how we can learn the syntax using the tools that are already in Flow. Um, just sort of like I've always encouraged people to learn XPath by leveraging InfoPath. You know, build your complicated condition using the UI, click the Edit XPath button, and, and take a look at what the XPath looks like. We can do some similar things here with the Flow syntax. So let's dive in. Now that I've got all my disclaimers out of the way, you guys, these are the services currently supported by Flow. Okay, so these are the different kinds of connectors and so forth that are currently supported. Um, the, the reason these are all such tiny pictures is because you can see there's a lot. Um, if you go uh, just to open up Flow and you go to the services list in, in the link there, um, you can see all of these and you'll be able to read them a little better. You'll notice a lot of these have a little green box uh, down below them. Those are premium. Um, and so I know Jen mentioned last week that there's, you know, free and premium versions. Um, and again, these are the services available today. Um, so uh, tomorrow there will be more. It's unlikely there will be less. Um, every time I see a little newsletter or hit the Flow blog, I see that there's new services being added, new things being added, new features being added. So this is definitely some place where Microsoft is focusing a lot of intention. Um, it's something where they're, they're putting a lot of uh, effort into it. And, and so I think that's one of the reasons why we've gotten pretty excited about it and we've started using it is because there's just, there's a richness here that indicates uh, indicates intent and investment, you know, and I mean, I know we're always kind of on the outside sort of guessing what are they going to, what are they going to really support, what's going to really make the cut, and what isn't, um, but my guess is, given the way flow is going right now, that this is going to be uh, something that's going to see a lot of future development and investment. So, let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, little frustrations you might run into. Um, why can't I delete, rename, or move this particular step? Usually it's because you've got a dependent action. Okay, so if you're looking at your flow and you want to rename something, a lot of times you can't rename it because of a dependent action, you can't delete it because of a dependent action, or you can't move it. Um, I, I know a lot of the time we don't think to click the help button in things. It's like, well, this should just make sense. Click the help button in Flow. Um, not all of them are going to be useful 
I, I know of one in particular that's not useful, um, but many of them are useful. I'm popping over here to this flow you'll see is wisely named test, and I've just been throwing random actions in it. Um, as I wanted to test and try things yesterday. So for example, this little action here is, um, you know, can I move him? Yes, I can move him. See how I got the little, uh, the little highlight there that shows the, the kind of the copy move thing? If he had been dependent on something from the prior action, I would not be able to move him. Does that make sense? So if I try to move join here, well, join's not gonna let me move him. Right? Um, if I try to rename this guy, I have to move this. I can rename get rows because nothing's dependent on him right now. Can I rename this one? You know, I can't. And you can see I've got the little I. Same with deleting. I can't because there's a dependent action. It's this join action down here that's dependent. So those are kind of some things to be aware of. Um, I have found that creating these different actions is usually quick enough that it's not that big of a deal to just delete a few things if, if I get kind of stuck and can't and can't get things rearranged the way I need them to be. But it just sort of a just sort of a heads up there, you know, that, that sometimes you won't be able to rename or move things and you definitely want to uh, take a look at these little these little eye icons to figure out why. Okay? Um, for each automatic container creation and so if you try to create a step using repeating data outside of a for each flow is going to create a container for you um, now <laughs> generally speaking hooray great <laughs> sometimes you're maybe not realizing that you've got repeating data or you don't uh, want a repeating container for some reason and so just just something to something to be aware of here I'm going to create a uh, compose action and these data operations um, just since the last time I'd looked at flow to use some of these data operations they'd added three or four very useful things so we're going to talk a little bit more about what some of those are so here for my inputs I've got um, a billion reasons why I should have given things a better name than join to because these different joins a lot of things are going to have a variable come out of them called output um, in which case you're going to really you're going to really wish you'd given this a better name it's sort of like when you look back at your first info path forms you ever designed and you think to yourself huh why is everything field one field two field three so learn from learn from my mistakes give everything meaningful names all the time right so I'm just going to grab this is from my uh, action earlier where I'm getting SharePoint list items. So you and I, we know this is repeating data, right? Because I'm getting SharePoint list items. And even if I had added a filter there that I knew was only going to return a single item, Flow is still going to consider this repeating data because it knows I'm getting SharePoint list items and, and that there could be more than one. So you can see what happened there, right? I added my compose and it, acts, it, it built an apply to each for me and threw it on there. And it even says why. You know, based on what you selected, we added a container for you. This enables you to perform actions for each individual item in a set of values. And it's simply because it, it looked up at my data source and said this is repeating. You cannot nest for eaches. So if I was to try to add an action here, and we're going to just pick compose again. Compose is a string builder. It's got some... Um, interested and it's not really a string builder I shouldn't say that it allows you to create a string that you can reuse um, it has some limitations and and I do have that on the list of things to talk about so I, I don't want to give it away right I know you guys are just hanging in anticipation okay so you can see what my error was now this time I selected something from get rows get rows is my SQL query it's returning um, one or more rows it's going to have an output that's an array type and you can see this output is an array a for each cannot be nested inside of another for each so I simply cannot use uh, one of those variables there okay so I just wanted to uh, to mention that that these are created for you so you know just just don't be surprised uh, 
read the messages. I know I say that all the time. Read the messages. It'll help you. Um, there's also something new called run after, or at least new to me. It wasn't here the last time I really built anything complex. Um, and so you can use it for air handling, uh, for more complex flows. Um, you know, if a step is skipped, you could send a message to someone. Uh, for example, it's skipped because the condition is not met. Maybe you need to take an alternate path in that case. Uh, what if your step times out for some reason, which I had happen in some of my uh, some of my various tests when I was um, doing some different stuff with SQL and so forth, I might have something time out. Um, and, and you can send yourself an error message or, or email someone or alert someone so you don't have to go check uh, your flows to see if they're running. You can alert yourself. Same with has failed. This is just an easy way to, to add um, some kind of more graceful air handling, which I know Jen mentioned this. Um, it is one of the really fine things about... Um, about flow is we've got some some better air handling so we can do you know just it's just these three dots configure run after and I can say oh this should run after send email to succeeds or if it's failed or if it's skipped or has failed I mean this is great you know this is a multi select you can select as many of these as you want um, and and determine when you want to run this whoops you know great error message thanks guys um, so I just wanted you to know about that one as well. Moving forward, these are the various data operations. I just mentioned the, that there were some new things. I mean, last time I looked at data operations, uh, create CSV, create HTML, um, join and select, I believe weren't there. I think all there was was compose, filter, array, and parse JSON. And initially, here we go back to why I'm talking about risk tolerance. Initially, uh, parse JSON for a little while there was not working, and then it got fixed, and that was great. But it it was one of those things where um, I was I wanted to use it to uh, pretty up an output from a SQL stored procedure to send it an email, and I could not. I was just I told my client I was like, so this string in your email is going to be ugly for about a month until they fix parse JSON. Are you good with that? He's like, oh yeah, that's better than nothing. I'm like, fantastic. You know, but it's just the sort of thing that you you have to have a little tolerance in there. Uh, for some flakiness. So compose, uh, create a string variable. Again, I know I keep kind of like bearing the lead on compose, but we're going to talk a little more about it later. Uh, create CSV table, create HTML table. Uh, these are pretty cool. They're like they say on the, on you know, it, it the, the name is descriptive. Um, you can take list data or SQL data and create a CSV. You can take uh, list data or SQL data or any kind of repeating data and create an HTML table. Right now, you cannot uh, determine which columns you're going to include. So let's just pretend you wanted to query uh, SharePoint list items and you've added an OData filter to only get back stuff for a specific person or a specific date or a specific amount um, and you'd like to email a table with this information. Create HTML table can do that for you. Um, it's going to return everything that's in your default view Right, so if, if you've got 4,000 columns in your default view, you're gonna have a pretty ugly table. And uh, as far as I could tell, it uses the internal column names uh, for the header. So if you include a header, you're going to possibly have some ugly names. Um, that's okay, better than nothing, and I think they're going to extend that. So one thing I read suggested that, that eventually we're going to be able to select columns for this stuff, and I imagine we're going to be able to pretty up the headers. However, it's there, it's functional, um, it's just not going to be the most beautiful thing in the world. Um, filter array, so we saw that message I got about uh, my output being a, an array, right, so it's a repeating, it's a, a list of items, um, and how I couldn't have a for each instead of a for each. Okay, so filter array lets us filter our repeating data after we've gotten it. A number of these actions allow us to add a filter via OData to only get back the data we want. That's great. 
But if you are in a situation where you get back the data you want and then you need to apply another filter to it for some reason that you couldn't apply initially or it's based on some other dependency, this is another layer of complexity that you're going to be able to add. You can say, okay, got my data back, now I need to make a decision and I want this data to go to Paul and I want this data to go to Jody, right? You could use filter array to get Paul's stuff and filter array to get Jody's stuff from this original data set. I'm, I'm helpfully making some hand gestures here that I know nobody can see, <laughs> but you can just imagine that. Okay, so join. Joins all the elements of an array into a string using a specified separator between each element. Where I've used join recently is in tandem with select, and it worked really nicely, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that before we move on. Um, Select is, is uh, you can select specified properties. They say properties from all elements. Um, I found you can select a single, uh, a single column. So why don't I show you that? Because I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm not describing it very eloquently. So if we go look, um, I'm going to move this guy back to where he was. Move this guy back to where he was. Oh, come on. Yeah. See? See how vicious it is? It's mean. Anyway, uh, unnecessary. I'll just close, yep, and reopen it. I think he was unhappy because I moved one and then moved it back. Okay, so now here is my select. Don't be confused by my SQL sitting here. Like I said, this was my test flow, and I just kept adding different actions so I could sort of see outputs. And we're going to take a look at a run of this so we can kind of see the outputs and talk a little bit more about that because I'm sure I haven't bored you all to tears yet. Um, <laughs> so here in my select, this is my value. You can see this is from my SharePoint guy. Look at that nice, look at that nice uh, logo there. That kind of helps you know what you're dealing with. Um, and my map, my poorly named map field is, this is the field I want to select, right? So since I put value as my from, my map can be anything that was from that SharePoint list. And I went ahead and grabbed title because that's what was of interest to me. And then down here in join, what I did was I took the body from the select. Now you can't tell that looking at this, but if you go and look at the select output, right, if we include that, you can see, well, I guess I took the body from someplace else. Sorry, my join is, I'm lying to you now. Oh, I had had bar, body from parse JSON on there. I see, I was goofing around with stuff. Okay, for my join, I can take the output from my select, which is going to be a string of these titles, and then I can join it with a break character. Does that make sense? Because what I want to do is I want a list of these titles and I want them with a break in between them so that I can send like sort of a simple table in email. So if you have, and the whole reason I'm talking about this, is if you have a single field in a SharePoint list and you need to just send a list of items to someone, which this is, this is a a uh, realistic scenario because one of my colleagues just pinged me the other day saying, hey, I've got a client, we want to use Flow for this, um, can we do this? They just need a list of the titles that, that apply. And I was like, I think, I think we've got some new stuff that does. And so if we do that, you can see this is a, a really fancy email and I've got some really great titles in here. But I had gone ahead and added a filter to only pull back two items. And then I sent them into an email using a uh, a break in my join and that just gave me a nice little a nice little list here so it's just another uh, another feature I wanted to make sure you were aware of select and join combine those to uh, stick a list of nicely uh, delimited items in an email you, I could have separated them with a comma um, you know and so forth but it, it just gives you uh, it gives you a, a different approach to sort of get things um, prettified and then parse JSON, I don't know, is anybody here very familiar with JSON? I'm not. I've just started looking into it basically to use it with Flow. Uh, but a lot of the outputs are returned in JSON, and I'm finding that there's some good online schema validators. Um, the parse JSON step actually also has a built-in schema validator, that, or I'm sorry, a built-in schema creator. So you can give it some output, and it will create the JSON schema for you for parsing. And we'll take a, a look at that should we... 
should we ever get to it. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm going on, you guys. I'm excited about this stuff. So um, another thing I just want you to be aware about, we're not going to look at it at, at any, in any depth, but there is a Flow app for iOS and for Android. And in that Flow app, you can run button flows. And so here's some sample templates of button flows. Um, I created a send myself a reminder in 10 minutes button flow on my phone. On my phone, it did a it did a push notification in 10 minutes. Um, they've got a uh, they've got a sample. I'm gonna try to get to my um, my notes here. So, boop, back to the taskbar. Back over here. Um, those are the services. We're just gonna do a quick search. I want you to I want you to see this uh, post real quick. Flow button flow. Um, so button flows. So there's a good blog post here that you can review introducing button flows. Um, his sample is pretty cool because he's using it to to do a Visual Studio Online build. Um, but you can use them for all kinds of things. You can manage your button flows. Yes, I want to leave this page. You can you can manage your button flows. Let me make sure my screen is still sharing. Is everything flash on me? It is. Okay. You can manage your button flows um, here with your other flows. But if I were to like start this flow now in 10 minutes, I'd get a push notification on my phone, right? So it's it's not gonna it's not gonna do anything here on my desktop. You can manage them here. You can build them here. Uh, you use them on you use them on your phone. Um, and they're just they're kind of cool. I haven't used them myself for anything yet, but I wanted you to know about them. And definitely go through the go through the little blog post if you're interested in them. Um, and they've had requests to make button flows available on other devices aside from like within the the flow app the flow app is kind of cool um, the idea that I could okay so the idea that I could set up a, a regular flow and then run it from my phone um, I like that I like that idea a lot so it, it you may find that to be useful and I just wanted to make sure you are aware of it because it's cool let's talk about SQL <clears throat> okay so for SQL Azure, no problem. Um, if you've got SQL Azure, if you're running an Azure VM with SQL on it, uh, connecting from Flow is no problem, easy peasy. If you're using on-premises, you have to use the on-prem data gateway. You guys will get this slide presentation. Here's a link to the download. Uh, here's there's two links here. The first one is sort of a high level how to install the gateway. The second one is more of a nitty gritty how to install the gateway. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to pretend like I'm a server girl. I'm not. I don't know um, a whole lot about these things and I haven't installed a gateway. But um, I do know of at least one person who I think is at this webinar who's using a gateway with an on-prem server. It's definitely doable. Um, if you're not a server person, get your server person involved because I'm sure there's some security stuff that has to be worked through to get this all uh, up and running correctly. But the good news is this will work with your on-prem stuff. And so you definitely want to investigate the SQL gateway if you, uh, if you need it. If you're just working with Azure, then Bob's your uncle, you're, you're good to go. And it looks like I went ahead and left this same information here again, even though I meant to move it, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> slide presentations are not really my thing. I'm not so great at them. So let's look real quick at these connections. To get to the connections that you've already created, you go to, let me get back here, you go to your connections. Um, so do settings. Right, flows, connections, gateways, custom connectors, etc. So we'll go look at our connections now. This shows me all of my all of my various connections that I've got created. It shows me any problems that I have, like for example, some of these old things that are not authenticated. Um, and we'll just scroll past all that hot mess and down to the SQL stuff. So if we get down to the SQL stuff, here's kind of what I wanted to show you. Um, this is really poorly named, right? I named this SQL Server, and and when I go look at this, it doesn't tell me anything about it. I don't know what SQL Server this connects to. Um, the only way I would be able to guess would be to use it and look at what tables are there. So don't be like me. Don't do what I've done, and give your give your connections a better name. And and again, like so much stuff, it comes back to naming. Use a name that you can remember and that you will 
that you will understand the next time you go to use this. Now, and here's right here is a little screenshot of that same stuff. So here's my DBXL3365 connection. At least I used the name of the server in there, right? So kudos to me for that. Um, but the fact is the stuff that you set up when you create the connection, you create a name, obviously, and then you put in your server name, your database name, and your credentials, these, your SQL authentication credentials. I would really recommend um, coming up with a naming convention and sticking with it. I think in retrospect, when I look back at my connections that I've got here, I would probably use server name, database name, and I may even include some information about the username in that in that connection name so that I could look at the connection name and I'd be like, oh, this connects to that server, that database, and it uses this username. I mean, if I had all that information on hand, I think it would be easier for me when I went to use the connection or if something went wrong with the connection. Here's our various SQL actions. Um, these are pretty straightforward in terms of what their names are. This should not be confusing any of us. The only one that I find troubling is get tables. That is because I do not understand why you would want to use it. But what get tables does, it gets you back a list of all the tables um, in your SQL database. And I am sure someone somewhere is going to come out of the woodwork and explain to me why this is useful. And that would be great. Um, get row does not return an array. It returns a single row, right? Get rows returns multiple rows. Insert, update, delete. Uh, those are pretty straightforward. Execute stored procedure. If you have output coming back from your stored procedure, that output will be JSON, and that's where parse JSON can come in handy uh, to kind of to kind of tidy that up. Um, for get row and update row and not insert get row and update row, um, you need to include the row ID. So, you know, initially I had. And I am sure a few months ago when I tried this, I had an issue uh, when I provided my row ID. And um, someone else who I've been you know, emailing with a little bit about Flow has mentioned with their on-prem, they had a issue as well. They got a bad gateway message when they were updating a row and they were using um, a row ID. I did test this just yesterday. Um, I used a hard-coded row ID here um, and what I did was that is, this is my daily time card, that row ID that I put in is my my ID column and it's a primary key, it's an int, it's an identity column and that worked just fine. So then I thought well what about a different scenario? What if my primary key wasn't an integer. What if it was just a random a random string? So I set up another test table where my primary key, let's pop back over to SQL here, my primary key here is uh, inchar, right? And, and so it's not an identity, it's not um, an int, and I put in a row ID of C. I had a row with <laughs> a row ID of C. The, the one thing I did note was that now, because this is not nullable, my, my uh, key row is not nullable, my key column is not nullable, I have to enter a value here. Um, so I did have to actually enter C again here. It wouldn't run the update if I didn't include a value for that. So just kind of something to be aware of. And in terms of composite keys, if you're dealing with a table that has composite keys, I don't even know. I didn't have a chance to experiment with that. Um, worst case scenario, hopefully it's a table you've got access to and you can throw an int uh, ID column on there and call it good and, you know, put in an identity column. Um, but so I hadn't had luck using uh, update row, then I did have luck. What I had recommended was that, um, whoa, sorry flashy slides there. I have a, uh, I have a, um, I have a tablet that I use for a mouse and every now and again he goes berserkers. So we're just going to boom, 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 get back to where we were. Um, the one thing I did recommend uh, to this other person that I was discussing this with was using stored procedures instead. And that's what I had reverted to when I had trouble with update row before I started using a stored procedure. And if you are in a scenario where you need to either insert or update, 
I would for sure write a stored procedure for that, right? And just do the heavy lifting on your SQL, on your SQL server um, because then that way you could just send in your data and if it already existed, you could update and if it was new, you could insert. Um, and, and I would probably leverage a stored procedure for that. I also have leveraged stored procedures to return some pretty HTML for emails. Um, I think I've got, now, now I'm scared, I'm scared to use my mouse now. I'm scared my machine's going to start going random again. I think I've got one, I've got one here somewhere. More SQL? Maybe it's in the sky? Uh, 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 sorry. You guys are so pleased I'm so organized, aren't you? And let me find the right, there it is. Okay, so this one, this is just a little sort procedure uh, that takes a part number. So this is actually, this was for some client work where they wanted, um, when a new form was submitted, they wanted to check for whether the same part number had had uh, failures and then they wanted to send an email. So what I did here was I used a stored procedure that took the part number, uh, checked the database. We were using DBXL to get form data into uh, data tables. Um, and then it returns an HTML string that's kind of uh, kind of pretty, and then I just set the value of the email body to that HTML string, and that way we got back a table of all the failures for this particular part number. So that was another case where using a stored procedure came in very handy, was to kind of aggregate this data. Um, and kind of anything else that Flow won't do out of the box. I mean, remember, even if your data is living in SharePoint or uh, you're submitting forms and you're not using DBXL to get your data into SQL or something like that, you can still use SQL. You can take your, your data that you're concerned about, you can stuff it into a temporary table, you can execute a stored procedure to act upon that data and, and do some aggregation and get you back what you need. Um, so if you've got something that you're just not seeing a way to do in Flow and you'd still like to use Flow, execute stored procedure is probably going to be um, a, a good route to take. You can use Flow to get user profile information. I had mentioned this, and we'll take a quick look at this. Um, so you do not suffer what I suffered. Um, this is not going to return the profile information from your SharePoint profile. So if your SharePoint user is set up with a certain manager, it's not going to get back that information. It uses Azure Active Directory. Um, don't ask me why. I don't know why. These aren't things I have answers to. <laughs> but, but I do know in your Azure Active Directory to set up my manager, for example, I went into Patrick's account and I got the GUID for his user. So I went to his profile. You know, I grabbed his GUID, which is going to show up here, that object ID right there. You know, I copied it and then I went back. Uh, I went back to my profile and I entered him there. And then I started getting back user profile information in my flow. And I'll show you where I've got him listed as my manager. So here's his manager ID right there. So Azure Active Directory is where we have that information. I'm just going to close this and go down here to get manager. You guys, I am using up so much time, and I apologize. I, I hope this is of value to you, but I just wanted to show you so much stuff, and I didn't realize how long this was going to take. Um, so, you know, here I've got to get my profile. Uh, no additional information is needed, right? And then we've got get user profile. I used this on a multiple person email list just because I wanted to see what the, the return was. We'll take a look at that. And then I used a, a get manager using... Um, I think this was from my user profile. Yeah, it was. Um, and so if we go and we look at this flows runs, no, I do not want to run it now. Let's go look at the flows runs. Failed, 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 failed. Yeah, I had something going on with this one, but I was still interested in it. So I don't get too worried. <laughs> I don't get too worried when I'm messing around with these guys if they fail, you know, because what I care about here is I want to go look at um, – you know, the outputs, right? So in this case, here's the output from, from my user profile, right? And we can see all that stuff. And then we can go look at get, get user manager or get manager. We can see the input was my username. And here's the outputs. And here's all of Patrick's information. So you can kind of see how you would be able then to get my manager's information uh, from my user profile. So I recently talked to somebody who wanted to then get that manager's manager well, obviously, we could add another get user profile, uh, get user profile step 
note the difference between get my profile, get user profile. So we could add get user profile, we could pass in Patrick's information, and we could run get manager again. And we could continue to do that, right? So that would allow you to get managers, manager, and so forth. Um, back to this. Okay, so just keep in mind that it's an Azure Active Directory. Um, it's not, not just in your, your SharePoint user profile, so be careful of that. OData filters. So standard OData syntax. You don't have to add the dollar sign filter equals or anything else. It's like title EQ test. Um, same syntax is used, it's OData is also used for SQL get rows. So if we're doing a get rows, you would use this same syntax. You would not pass in uh, standard SQL, right? We're not going to do, you know, name not equal, etc. So, so you need to be uh, kind of in tune to that and prepared for that. Um, Select query, we also have that for SQL get rows where you can say which rows you want. You'll notice we do not have that for SharePoint get items yet. And I would guess that that's coming. Um, I It's not there yet, but for quite a while they had the OData fields available in the uh, SharePoint list uh, get SharePoint list items, and yet it wasn't implemented. So that's the sort of thing where it's, it's you know, you want to keep an eye out um, on the forums and the blogs to kind of get a sense of, you know, does this work yet, does it not? Um, filter query, you'll see this one. Here's my total amount column. This column has a space in it, and this is what I was kind of messing with yesterday was, well, then what do I put in here for my filter query? It's the X0020, so it is using that, that internal name. So that's just something else to be aware of, and this will return, you know, I've got two items in this list, um, and I don't know why it's showing the list quit instead of the list name right now. That's another little mystery to me. And then down here in our SQL get rows, you know, we can see that we've got uh, just these two, just these two columns coming back. And if we go back and we look at a run of this, and I've got a bunch of failed runs right now for a variety of reasons, but let me just click OK a couple hundred times. All right, I don't know why this page is being like this. OK. It's decided that it does not love me. Let's try one more time here. Okay, there we go. Now we left that page, and it blocked you guys out again, but you're coming back. Okay, so if we go take a look at uh, one of the runs of this flow, let's go look at one that claims to have succeeded, and we do a get items, right? We can see here is, this was before I added that filter. We'll look at this one. Get items. More. Okay, so here this has our filter of total amount greater than 42, um, and we can see we've gotten back. Mm -hmm. This is not being very nice to me right now. We'll scroll down. So there's one item, and you can see this is JSON, right? This is a JSON return. You can mess with this and use parse JSON to get back just the columns you want. Um, so we can see we've got items where, I want to show you where total amount is greater than 42, but you know, there's one, 108, 34, um, and so forth. So you can scroll through the data and you can see what you're getting back. And if we go down here to our get rows, this is why I love flow, folks, is because I can actually go look and see you know, what's coming back instead of dealing with this black box of, of SharePoint designer workflows. So this is the one where I said that I wanted just projects and hours. And if you start looking down here at the columns that are returned in our, in our output, we've just got projects and hours. Well, we've got an internal item ID. But, you know, <laughs> there's, otherwise we've just got the columns we want. So that can be extremely useful. Okay. Um, Back to slides. I see we had a question. Are Azure Active Directory entries automatically created from SP profiles? I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, I do not know the answer to that. I do know when I first started trying Power Apps is when I found out that this manager data was being pulled in Power Apps from Azure Active Directory instead of SharePoint. And at that point in time, my organization didn't have Azure Active Directory set up. And so I had to go ask... Uh, 
our server admin, Jim Cantwell, I had to ask Jim if we could start using Azure Active Directory. This was a year and a half ago, so I don't know I don't know enough about the interaction between SharePoint profiles and Azure Active Directory. So if somebody knows something about that and wants to kind of um, chime in, that would be fantastic. But it's just it's just outside of my realm of knowledge. Sorry, I wish I could be more helpful. Um, so here's the Compose thing. Um, it's not right to call Compose something that creates variables because you cannot change this once it's created. So you can't really use it like a string builder. You can't like use Compose to set something up and then append to it inside of a loop, okay? Um, if, if you need to reuse some text, however, this is, it's always better, it's always better to hard code text one time and not 15 times. So if you've got a flow where you've got a certain string that you know you're going to be reusing frequently, let's say um, you've got three different statuses that you're going to be setting things to and you're going to be doing this in more than one spot, um, I would use compose and set up my, my three different statuses as three different variables and I'd name each one and then I would do that because if you do it that way, when somebody changes their mind and says, well, we don't want to say draft anymore, we want to call these pending. Right? You can change it in one place instead of digging through your flow and changing it in 16 places. So that would be a place where you would want to use uh, Compose. And, okay, today, right, it's the 25th of May. Today, we can't append to a Compose string. We can't, um, we can't build onto it. But that doesn't mean that tomorrow or next week or three months from now that won't be added. So it's something to keep an eye on. But for right now, its usage is really mostly limited to uh, places where you don't want to be um, dragging, you know, writing the same string a billion places. Finally, advanced conditions. So even if you have the condition right, you could have a failure when the flow runs, and that's what the screenshot's up. It's very clear what I've done wrong, okay? It says right here, the template language function starts with, expects its second parameter be of type string, the provided value is type integer. I passed in an integer where a string was expected, okay? So I was able to save my flow with a condition that used an advanced condition, but it failed anyway, and that was okay. Um, because I was able to learn from that what I had done wrong. If we take a look at a condition, you guys, I'm just killing you on time. I'm so sorry. If we take a look at an advanced condition here, let's go, uh, we'll edit this flow. Where's something with a condition? I don't have anything with a condition. An action, whoops, not what I wanted to do. Cancel. Okay, um, but, um, new step, I want to add a condition. All right, so if I do something like uh, this, I want to say hours, um, that's great, it put it in a loop for me, is equal to 10. Okay, I want to do something if somebody has 10 hours. Look, you click edit in advanced mode, and there you've got the text right there. You can see, oh, okay, so that's what this text looks like, you know? You paste it in. Now, just so you know, only the very beginning of this condition needs the little at symbol. Everything else just uses the syntax, as you can find in the Logic Apps workflow definition language. Uh, Jen included a link for you. Um, I'll include a link for you. Uh, not everything, oh, I guess I don't have it up here anymore, not everything in there is going to be useful to you in flows, but for building more complicated conditions, if you need more than one thing, um, you're going to end up having to do your ands and your ors by hand like this. And another thing just to be aware of that, that you know, right now if I go back to edit in basic mode, no problem. But if I paste in an advanced condition, and try to go back to edit in basic mode, mm -mm, can't switch. And now watch. If I delete my condition and try to edit in basic mode, it still won't let me. So I end up having to paste back in my original condition. It's just something to know, right? And now I can pop back to edit in basic mode. So consider this condition builder. Use it like you would an XPath builder in InfoPath. Build conditions, look at them, 
and then copy them out and combine them on your own. And you can see and and or, you can look up how not works and how, how, how to do ands and ors and so forth. You can nest things and you can get pretty complicated there like Jen was saying. So that is that on conditions. Here's my little picture of look, this, this, don't let this scare you. Um, I do have, <laughs> I do have one other little demo I just want to show you and this is more of a, a kind of a, more of an end-to-end -end thing. I understand if you have to drop off because I've gone way over on time. Um, so I wanted to show you this because this is, yes, I want to leave this page. We're gonna, we're gonna do this thing again where, uh, Edge pretends it doesn't know me and stops sort of responding. So that's neat. And we're just going to go here again because I'm tired of it. So this is uh, this is actually a lot of times we have demos or, you know, just in general, you attend a webinar and the demo is like, oh, here's this thing we built. And, and it doesn't have any relationship with reality or an actual business need. This is a something I rebuilt um, that is related to an actual business need and was something that I did for a customer. Basically, it's a recurrence flow. They have it run every single Monday night. They have a list of resources on their website, and when I talk about resources, I mean people, you know, human resources. And we go through the list of resources, and then for every single person there, we check to see if they submitted their daily time card. Now, the daily time card for them is a... Uh, it's a form that submits to a form library that uses DBXL to put the data into, uh, into SQL. And you can see we've got a DBXL hash here. Uh, it goes into, for us, we're using this daily, daily time card database. Um, but what they do is we have a stored procedure running that they run from their flow that goes and checks and sees what days did you miss, if any. And then if you did miss any dates, we're going to send you an email telling you what dates you did miss. And in the end, we send an email um, to the uh, manager and, you know, basically say, here are the resources that are missing time. And so we're leveraging a stored procedure for that. Um, it has an output parameter of missing dates, and that returns a string of missing dates. And so it's already aggregated into a single string. Um, we parse the output using uh, parse JSON. This was what I wanted to show you. So you can see right here, there's use sample payload to generate schema. So I don't know JSON. We're gonna pretend you don't know JSON. And so I'm not really sure what a valid JSON schema looks like, but I can use output to create that schema, which means I can go and look at a previous run. I had a bunch of failures yesterday because I used up all my allotted resources for sending email because I was messing around so much with this. So um, things kind of went berserk. But we can go here, we can look at our, our content. We can look at the output. Here's the output that came out of our SQL stored procedure right there. Those were my missing dates. This guy didn't get any of his time cards in. And so I can go here into my use sample payload right, and I can paste this, I can copy this, I can paste this and say done, and then that's gonna generate this schema for me. So until we all learn JSON, this is a great way to figure out what you need to do to parse the output. And then what happens here is that will make this pretty. You know how I mentioned that originally we were sending an ugly email, and we were. I was sending literally this output, which meant that in the email, this is what they were getting. Missing dates and quotes, colon, quotes around a string of dates. It wasn't pretty. Um, and so now what they get is they get a, a more attractive email that says missing dates, and then it has the, the list of dates. You know, you can see down here in the in the email, I'm checking to make sure I've got a recurrent return code of one. Um, because that's what I'm returning from my story procedure when, when, when there was missing dates. If there weren't missing dates, it would return a zero. Um, and then I've got, just a reminder, you've got missing time cards, update as soon as possible. And here's the missing dates JSON output, okay? I am, <laughs> I'm, thank you for hanging in with me. I know uh, this was an awful lot. Um, I would love to show you more. I, this is cool stuff, you guys. And like I said, they're building and changing on it all the time. Um, there is a flow community. Look, this is the Microsoft one. And I don't want to, I don't mean to take anything from them. Um, however, 
I hang out on InfoPath Dev still a lot, mostly because we support that forum. And so it's kind of my, boy, that trackpad and I are not getting along. Uh, it's kind of my, uh, it's kind of my, my, uh, my place, you know, where I like to, where I like to be. Um, and so I did create two new forums there, one for Power Apps, one for Microsoft Flow. So if you've got questions um, and you're not getting a response at the Flow community and you want to post on IPDev, do. Um, I don't think, I don't think there really is such a thing as a Flow expert yet, um, but we're really interested in it and we're really interested in trying and building things with it. So I'd love to kind of collaborate with you via the forum. Um, here we've got the, the workflow definition, um, the free versus premium links, those are there for you. Um, finally, it would not be a Hillary webinar if it did not end with a pep talk. If you have not tried this, I encourage you to try this. Do not be discouraged. Do not be heavy hearted. New stuff is hard. New stuff is challenging. It's always a little confusing. There's not much documentation, but this stuff is cool and you can figure it out. Try stuff, test stuff, Look at, your, look at your flows that have gone through. Read those messages. JSON is human readable, just like XML is human readable. You're a human. You can read it. So, so I encourage you to give these things a try. Um, does anybody have, at this point, any, any questions? Um, if so, uh, just pop them into, just pop them into the, the questions. And um, if not, um, you know, I hope... I hope you come away from this feeling at least like you've had a deeper dive into what's available there and have a good sense of some of the possibilities. We do have a survey. If there are services you're using kind of outside of this, you know, SharePoint SQL ecosystem and you would be interested in seeing uh, a webinar that was more of a dive into some of those specific services, uh, let me know in the survey if you... Uh, want to have something where we go a little slower and focus on one specific thing, let me know. We're into flow right now and we would love to help you get into flow too. So I see we've got, have you done any reporting from flow in SQL and how have you done it? Um, I am not sure, uh, Edward, what you mean by reporting from flow. I guess maybe, you know, if, if we're thinking about um, aggregating data, so first off, the answer is no. I, I haven't done reporting from Flow. Um, SSRS report. Um, ooh, that's kind of interesting. So I kind of, can I unmute you? Do you have audio, Edward? <laughs> I'm like <laughs> trying to figure out if I can give you the mic so you can ask your, your question because I'm kind of interested in what you're, in what you're talking about here. Um, unmute. I hope I'm unmuting you. I'm not sure. It looks like you're still muted. Make presenter, make organizer, make panelist. Sorry guys, I'm so good with GoToWebinar. I think I just made you staff. Can, can you, do you have audio now, Edward? Well, maybe not. Uh, at any rate, interesting question, but I'm not really quite sure what you're what you're getting at. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I've just tried making you a panelist, and and uh, and your phone doesn't show disabled anymore. But I also don't think you can uh, can talk. At any rate, sorry about that. Send me, drop me an email. Drop me an email. Uh, I'm gonna put my email here in. Yeah, I'm going to put my email here in the question answer box and drop me an email kind of outlining what you're asking uh, because I don't think I quite understand. Um, I'm just going to send my email to everybody because that's how I am. And so, yeah, drop me an email. Let me know what you're asking. Um, I mean, obviously, we could use Flow to push data into SQL from SharePoint or from some other place, and then you can use SSRS to report on data that's in SQL. So... But I don't feel like I'm I don't feel like I'm grokking your question or answering it well. So at any rate, uh, yeah, drop me an email. So if there's nothing else question wise, I hope I didn't overwhelm anyone. Uh, it's cool stuff. Give it a try. Thank you so much for coming and for hanging with me through it all. And uh, drop me an email if there's something specific you're wondering about. Um, and fill out the survey at the end. And I hope everybody just has a fantastic week. Thanks so much.